try and keep that up. Uh, so remember this next time we're a few minutes late. Two minutes early. Two, two minutes early even. That's right. Even some of your colleagues haven't even made it in the room yet. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I have a few things, and then we'll turn to questions first. Uh, today and tomorrow, a large delegation of senior officials from the U.S. government are attending the first meeting of the Negev Forum Working Groups in Abu Dhabi, joining representatives from the governments of Bahrain, Egypt, Israel, Morocco, and the United Arab Emirates in an effort to advance initiatives to encourage regional integration and cooperation. These meetings followed the March 2022 Negev Summit held in Sidi Boker, Israel, which launched the Negev Forum, as well as the June 2022 <coughs> Steering Committee meeting in Bahrain, where the six topical working groups focused on regional security, clean energy, food and water security, health, tourism, and education and coexistence were set up. The working groups seek to advance coordinated initiatives to encourage regional integration, cooperation, and development to promote security, peace, and economic prosperity for the benefit of people of the region, including initiatives that could strengthen the Palestinian economy and improve the quality of life of Palestinians. The Negev Forum is one of the series of initiatives to promote integration in the region as a foundation for an increasingly more secure and prosperous region. These initiatives include the expanding bilateral relations between Abraham Accord signatories, the I2U2 I2 with Israel, India, United Arab Emirates, and the United States, which is developing clean technology and food security initiatives following the President's visit to the region last year, and security initiatives and joint exercises under the auspices of Central Command. More than two years after the anniversary of the Abraham Accords and other agreements, we continue to see numerous benefits throughout the Middle East, including regional, uh, including increasing economic relationships, more robust people-to-people -people ties, growth in tourism, direct flights, cultural, research, and academic exchanges, and better coordination on a range of other issues. The Biden administration remains focused on strengthening and expanding these opportunities whenever possible. Next, since last year's devastating floods in Pakistan, the U.S. government has worked closely with Pakistan to provide funding assistance for flood response, food security, disaster preparedness, and capacity building efforts. I am pleased to share that today the United States announced an additional $100 million of recovery and reconstruction funding, funding, bringing our total contribution to over $200 million. The new $100 million in funding will be used, to, uh, will be used for flood protection and governance, disease surveillance, economic growth and clean energy, <laughs> climate smart agriculture, food security, and infrastructure reconstruction. The funding also includes humanitarian assistance to support flood relief and recovery efforts in refugee hosting areas. Our flood-related assistance complements our broader efforts to form a U.S.-Pakistan Green Alliance that looks at the range of climate and resilience issues central to Pakistan's reconstruction. Pakistan's recovery and reconstruction will be, continue, will be a continuing process in the months and years ahead, and we will continue to support Pakistan in its efforts to build a more climate-resilient future for its people. And finally, on January 12th, the United States government, in partnership with the government of Japan, will sponsor the fifth Indo-Pacific Business Forum, or IPBF. The IPBF is an opportunity to discuss shared ambitions for the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, as well as our respective priorities for the United States APEC host year and Japan's G7 presidency in 2023. The IPBF will also showcase high-impact private sector investment and government efforts to support market competition, job growth, and high standard development for greater prosperity and economic inclusion in the Indo-Pacific. This hybrid event will feature an in-person program in Tokyo and a virtual component time to allow for meaningful participation from across the Indo-Pacific region. For further information on the IPBF and how you can register, we encourage you to visit our website, www.indopacificbusinessforum.com. With that plug, turn it over to the questions. Right. Uh, thanks, and I'll be very brief since I was late. I apologize. Um, uh, but you guys have a number. Sorry, go on. <laughs> you guys have a number of in initiatives out there about uh, the deal with war crimes uh, or potential war crimes or investigating potential war crimes in, in Ukraine. And I'm just wondering, um, Jake's comments this morning in uh, Mexico City about looking at uh, or saying that Iran might be complicit in any such uh, war crimes uh, is something that is being looked at. So I'm just wondering, is this an active area of uh, investigation from at least from the elements that you guys are involved in? 
So, Matt, you were right that there are a number of elements, and we are discussing, and when I say we, I mean primarily uh, here at the State Department, Beth Van Schock, uh, our ambassador at large for global criminal justice uh, and her team, uh, and others are discussing with other countries, with other entities, other venues, vehicles, and fora uh, that may be appropriate to help uh, adjudicate the question of war crimes. We've talked about some of the initiatives that are already underway. First and foremost, uh, the cooperation we have and the support we're lending to the Prosecutor General of Ukraine and to that entity, uh, knowing that the Prosecutor General, of course, has jurisdiction, has uh, immense interest in pursuing these crimes, but also what the OSCE is doing, uh, what the Human Rights Council has set up with the support uh, of Secretary Blinken and the United States, and other initiatives that have been put forward by other countries uh, and entities as well. We've also made the point that we're not looking merely at those responsible for pulling the trigger uh, or for pressing the button, as it were. Uh, we are prepared, uh, in accordance with international humanitarian law, to go all the way up the ladder to see to it who precisely is responsible for issuing these orders, uh, and not only for taking these actions. Uh, if, in the course of that work, uh, we are uh, we are in a position to determine that the Iranian government as a whole, or that senior Iranian officials, uh, are complicit or responsible for war crimes, uh, we will work to hold them to account as well. Uh, we've made no secret of the fact that Iran is providing Russia with much-needed security assistance. And security assistance uh, is almost euphemistic in this sense, because uh, this is more to the point the provision of lethal equipment that Russia is using every single day to target civilian infrastructure, to target energy infrastructure, uh, to potentially even target civilians themselves. We made the determination early on in Russia's war against Ukraine that Russia's forces have committed war crimes. Uh, we have continued to document evidence of war crimes. And if that evidence points to another state, points to other foreign actors involved in these war crimes, we'll work to hold them to account as well. Okay, but you, like, as you just said, you have already made that determination That's right. with Russia. That's right. You have not yet made it. We have not made a formal determination uh, when it comes to other states or state actors. Thank you. Can we follow up on that one? Sure. How much Russia, Iran, is extensive national terms designated by the United States government? Does it change how you got once you make a determination, how you approach the for crimes investigation, and also accountability for folks in the United States be able to you know, go after Iranian leaders by using the US law and by also, also using, by fact, using the fact that Iran is the sponsor, the sponsor within the US and the legal system. There, there are certain differences between the state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, designation that uh, Iran carries uh, and other designations that uh, are attached to Russian entities, to Russian actors. Uh, but uh, the designation of a state sponsor of terrorism uh, doesn't allow us, <clears throat> or I should say, uh, the fact that Russia is not a designated state sponsor uh, of terrorism does not deprive us of any tools that we can appropriately uh, and as warranted yield uh, again, wield against the Russian government. Uh, we have a number of authorities that we have used to hold Russia uh, to account. We've imposed biting sanctions, biting uh, export controls, other economic and financial measures. You can see the effectiveness of those measures, the compounding effectiveness of those measures across many different metrics that you look at, even the metrics that uh, the Russian government, the central bank, uh, the uh, Russian finance ministry has itself uh, issued. You see that in the slowing economic growth and the economic downturn, uh, but also in the mere fact that Russia is being forced to turn to states with whom it typically has not partnered on security assistance. Iran being one of them, the DPRK uh, being another as well. Uh, so we are wielding every appropriate authority. Uh, we're also working with Congress, working with Congress to attempt to uh, find a way to hold Russia accountable for its aggression uh, in such a way that allows us to impose costs uh, without having to grapple with the unintended, unintended uh, implications that 
the state sponsor of terrorism designation carries. We were sanctioned seven Iranian uh, industry leaders uh, just last Friday, uh, the leaders of the factory, the drone factory, and uh, also Mrs. Parker's uh, state, also involved in the Mrs. Parker. What's the next step in this case? Uh, is the Iranian Supreme Leader uh, potential subject to, uh, to, 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 to U.S. sanctions uh, once you determine he was involved in this case? Well, these sanctions are, are pursuant to various executive orders. These executive orders uh, are uh, spell out precisely the criteria uh, that we look at when we determine if a foreign actor is a potential target uh, for any given uh, executive order. So uh, we're not taking anything off the table. We are going to do and take actions that uh, intend to disrupt this pipeline of lethal supplies, lethal materials uh, that have gone from Iran to Russia. But we've also talked about this as a two-way street. Uh, the relationship between Russia and Iran uh, is uh, one of a close security partner, a close military partner. Iran has become Russia's most important uh, supplier of needed security <laughs> assistance, but Russia too uh, has in turn started to provide Iran with uh, security assistance that it needs. So we are going to look at all relevant tools, all relevant authorities, all relevant uh, laws that are on the books uh, to hold to account those who are responsible for this. Tomorrow. Can we go to Brazil sure. and let me Can ask I follow you. Russia one more time? Uh, one, one more on Russia? Yes. Uh, at the recent summit between, uh, I mean, Russian President Putin and the Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, highlighted their uh, military cooperation. How do you think China and Russia military cooperation will affect Ukraine and the Korean Peninsula? Well, uh, I can speak to uh, Ukraine, of course, and we have made uh, also no secret of the fact that we are watching very closely. We are watching very closely the decisions that the PRC makes when it comes to uh, any Russian requests for security assistance. We know that Russia has been forced, as I've already said, to turn to uh, other partners, Iran, the DPRK, for security assistance precisely because we are starving uh, the Russian state of the inputs that it needs to prosecute uh, its war against Ukraine most effectively. And again, that is uh, putting it euphemistically. Uh, we are starving systematically the Russian government of what it needs, what it thinks it needs to fulfill what it deems as its mission to kill the Ukrainian people, to target Ukrainian infrastructure, uh, to go after uh, Ukrainian cities and towns uh, hitting in the process civilian targets, apartment buildings, residential buildings, schools, hospitals, nurseries, uh, nothing, it seems, has been off limits uh, to the Russian state in its pursuit of this brutal war. So we're watching very closely. Uh, we've been very clear with the PRC, including in private, including when the two presidents met in Bali last November, uh, about any costs that would befall uh, the PRC, should they decide to assist uh, Russia in a systematic effort to evade U.S. sanctions or in the provision of security assistance that would then be used against the Ukrainian people uh, in Ukraine. So we're watching very closely. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to, to China, China later. Go ahead. Yeah, just on this Brazil uh, Bolsonaro's visa, I understand you have restrictions due to privacy and all that, but can you confirm that an a1 visa would be valid for 30 days, and would an A1 visa assigned to anyone, uh, head of state, would automatically become void if that person, that individual, is no longer a head of state? Sure. Uh, so I don't want to uh, try to guess at what your underlying question is, but uh, let me just state out of an abundance of caution uh, that I've, uh, I am, of course, uh, not going to comment on the visa records of any individual. Individual visa records, as you know, are uh, confidential, uh, and we wouldn't speak to the status of any particular individual. Leaving individuals aside, and generally speaking, uh, if someone entered the United States on an A visa, which is essentially a, a diplomatic visa for uh, foreign diplomats or heads of state, uh, an A visa holder, uh, if an A visa holder is no longer engaged in official business on behalf of their government, 
it is incumbent on that visa holder to depart the U.S. or to request a change uh, to another immigration status within 30 days. Uh, that request for uh, a change in visa status would be made to the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, so it would be incumbent on the visa holder to take that action, either to depart the United States or to request that change in status. Have you, are you in a position to say whether uh, the visa holder that we're all talking about... Not I'm not talking about a visa holder. Okay, fine. <laughs> are you able to say that you have received any request of change of status? I, I, you haven't attached any names. I wouldn't uh, comment on any individuals. I'm not commenting on any individuals. I'm commenting on a class uh, of, of visa. Can I attach a name to it? <laughs> uh, uh, for, uh, the current president, Lula, um, said yesterday after what happened in Brasilia that he believes that uh, former President Bolsonaro bears at least some responsibility based on his, uh, his, his past comments. Is that the same assessment of the United States? And if so, is former President Bolsonaro somebody who'd be welcome in the United States? President uh, Lula has called for an investigation. There, uh, as I understand it, is an ongoing uh, investigation in Brazil. Uh, you heard from the president yesterday. You heard from the secretary yesterday. You heard from Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, yesterday uh, that we condemn this violence. Violence is uh, never appropriate. It's never the answer. Uh, Brazil's democratic institutions have uh, our full support, as we always are. Uh, we are standing by for any requests requests for assistance uh, from our Brazilian partners, from Brazilian authorities, whether those come through diplomatic channels, whether they come through law enforcement channels. Uh, and we will, of course, uh, respond to those requests uh, as appropriate. The United States and Brazil, we are close partners. We work together day to day on any number uh, of matters and issues. And oftentimes, those are matters of law enforcement. We have well-honed processes in place uh, to cooperate where requests are made for information or potentially for action uh, on the part of Brazil to the United States. In this case, uh, we have not yet received any requests for information or for action. Uh, leaving aside uh, Bolsonaro personally, um, is there any concern that perhaps some of the, the plotting in this have taken place in the United States and foreign countries? This will be a question for the Brazilian investigation. Uh, if it would be useful for Brazilian investigators uh, to uh, re be in receipt of information from the United States government, uh, we, we would, of course, adjudicate those requests promptly, uh, as we always do, and provide them with appropriate information. But uh, we haven't received such a request. Just, just one more, um, a little bit more broadly. Um, you've often spoken, and the president has often spoken, about democracy being conducted by the by the United States, so this is one of the, the, the major parts of the administration's agenda. Um, is there a bit of a concern at all that perhaps there's also another model in the United States that being about January 6th, that of violent overthrow of uh, democratic institutions? How much of a concern is that, that that's something that could also emanate from the United States? And what can um, the State Department or the administration do to counter that? Well, what the world saw emanate from the United States yesterday was immediate, Brazil. swift condemnation of what happened what was ongoing in Brazil at the time. Uh, that was violence against Brazil's democratic institutions. What the world heard and saw in the United States yesterday uh, was swift and immediate support for Brazil's democratic institutions. Uh, that message was loud and resoundingly clear. Uh, today, the world heard that from President Biden, from Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada, from President Oprah, uh, Lopez Obrador uh, of Mexico as well in their joint statement. So that is precisely what the world has been seeing and hearing from the United States uh, over the past uh, 24 hours. Uh, of course, we've consistently made the point, including uh, in the aftermath of events in this country, uh, that every democracy has its challenge. Uh, it is a reflection of the strength of that democracy how it grapples with, how it responds to those challenges. Uh, and speaking in the case of Brazil, uh, we've seen remarkable resilience from de Brazil's democracy over the past 24 hours. Uh, the violence was quelled within hours. The institutions were cleared of violent uh, protesters within hours. Uh, a range of Brazil Brazilian voices from across the political spectrum have condemned it. Uh, President Lula addressed uh, his people. Uh, we've heard Brazilian uh, politicians from all parties and all stripes uh, condemn this violence as they well should. Uh, anything else on Brazil? Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. At least four um, American legislators, they uh, asked the federal government, U.S. federal government, to do not allow the presence 
of the Brazilian former president Bolsonaro here in the country. From your perspective, can this fact generate a diplomatic incident in between the two countries? Uh, no, because we have excellent cooperation with our Brazilian partners. Uh, as I said before, we, on a daily basis, work with our Brazilian partners through diplomatic channels, through law enforcement channels as well. And if there is a law enforcement matter that needs to be adjudicated between the United States and Brazil, uh, we have well-honed, well-practiced processes for doing so, uh, and we're prepared to do that. But as I mentioned before, we haven't received any specific requests just yet. Uh -huh. Regarding the new ambassador that she is swearing uh, in in a couple of minutes. Uh, from your perspective, what is going to be her main mission once she arrives in Brasilia, taking into account everything that happened yesterday? Well, the, the main objective for any ambassador, any U.S. embassy, anywhere around the world is really twofold. Number one, uh, it is to provide steady leadership to our team, and we obviously have a very large mission uh, in Brazil, uh, encompassing a number of facilities, but also uh, this gets to the second charge, which is uh, executing the president and the secretary's vision for that bilateral relationship. We also have a broad bilateral relationship with Brazil. It's a pivotal time in terms of U.S.-Brazilian uh, relations with uh, the new government, with this government, eager to work with President Lula and his team. Uh, I think you uh, have seen that in the early engagement we had with President Lula, with senior U.S. officials traveling to Brazil. He was referring as we might defend in a way that we Sure. Uh, at the strategic level, there is absolute consensus. There is absolute unanimity with our Israeli partners. We both wholeheartedly, fully are committed to the fact that Iran must never be able to acquire a nuclear weapon. Uh, that is the commitment President Biden has. That is the same commitment that we've heard from Prime Minister Netanyahu. It is, by the way, the same commitment that we heard from Prime Minister Netanyahu's predecessors. So we are in lockstep when it comes to that strategic goal. Now, there's no secret, and Jake alluded to that this morning, that when it comes to how we do that, there may be some tactical differences. There are some tactical differences. Uh, we've made no secret about that. We have a relationship with Israel that uh, is close enough that it allows us to have candid conversations. And when we disagree, we disagree. We tell them what we think. Uh, they certainly uh, don't shy away from telling us what they think. We believe that a diplomatic, uh, 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 maintaining that a diplomatic, uh, that diplomacy, I should say, presents the most uh, viable, durable, sustainable means by which to permanently and verifiably prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, that has always been our focus. Now, it has not always been the focus of the Iranians. And in fact, uh, they have repeatedly turned their backs on a diplomatic deal in the form uh, of what was on the table. That was a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. They did that most recently in September. It hasn't been on the agenda ever since. We continue to believe that diplomacy prevents uh, the most attractive option, but uh, we also agree with our Israeli partners uh, that we shouldn't take anything off the table. We haven't taken anything off the table. And as we meet with our Israeli partners, uh, one of the many issues we discuss is the most, the, uh, the various means by which uh, we can see to it that Iran never acquires a nuclear weapon. So when you say, sorry, can I just follow on this? When you say that diplomacy is your preferred option, does that mean that you, dis you disagree with your own president when he says on a leak tape that the threat is dead and there's no going back to diplomacy? The president did not say diplomacy is dead. Not at all. Uh, the, the negotiation the, in Vienna. Is, the, is the, the, the president was alluding to the fact, which should be clear to everyone in this room, that the Iranians swiftly killed, the Iranians killed the prospect for a swift return to compliance with the JCPOA. A return to compliance with the JCPOA isn't on the agenda. It's not on the agenda for primarily one reason. That's because the Iranians turned their back on it. The Iranians reneged on commitments uh, they had made. Uh, in the absence of that being on the agenda, uh, we are focused first and foremost on, at the moment on what we can do to support the brave Iranian people who are taking to the streets uh, across Iran, uh, but also what we can do to disrupt, to counter the support that the Iranian regime is providing to Russia, support that Russia is in turn turning around and using with deadly vengeance uh, against the Ukrainian people. So if the Iranian comes back tomorrow and says we're willing to, res to resume the talks, then you will. 
Uh, I don't entertain hypotheticals. I also don't entertain uh, scenarios that are just that that, that are just uh, incredibly improbable. Uh, e even 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 if the Iranians did come back tomorrow, we have a track record here, unfortunately, uh, a track record that suggests to us uh, that the Iranian word uh, is isn't worth the. Choose your metaphor. Uh, I, we, of course, uh, have been have been down this road with them. Uh, so we, of course, want to see this resolved peacefully. We want to see this remote resolved uh, diplomatically. Uh, but uh, we are going to, in the absence of uh, any real interest in diplomacy on the part of the Iranians, uh, continue to keep our focus on supporting the Iranian people. Keep our focus on countering uh, Russia's support of security assistance to excuse me, Iran support support. Iran's security assistance to Russia. No, that it was the United States that backtracked on its words, correct? With the, the ICGPOA. Uh, no, Saeed, that is not correct. It was not? That is not, not correct. the United States that pulled out of the deal? You, I, I am referring to last September. You, you may be going uh, yes. further back. Yes. Look, uh, we can we can relitigate this. Uh, I, we have also made no secret of the fact that this administration considers uh, the decision on the part of the last administration to withdraw from the JCPOA uh, one of the greatest strategic blunders uh, of American foreign policy in recent years. Will, uh, just one more on the on the, on the visa issue. Uh, will, will, go ahead. Uh, just one more on the visa issue. Uh, would it be out of the ordinary for a uh, head of state, head of government, to arrive in this country on? Something other than an A visa? I, I would be hard pressed to think of a scenario in which a sitting head of state or a diplomat would travel to the United States on a uh, on a, something other than an A visa if that person were here in furtherance of official business. Uh, as diplomats, uh, I'll, I'll use me. I, I assume I have a Privacy Act waiver for myself. Uh, if I were to take a vacation in a foreign country, I wouldn't travel on my diplomatic visa. I would use my tourist visa. You could imagine uh, a foreign diplomat or a foreign head of state uh, coming to the United States uh, purely for tourism purposes and not traveling on an A visa, but uh, I couldn't speak to any particular. Is that the case for uh, Bolsonaro? <laughs> uh, go ahead. Uh, yes. On Iran, I will also follow up on Bernie. So you say that the Iranians have swiftly killed the prospects of a swift return to sea. And also, you said your preference is diplomacy. And also, you are saying that it's incredibly improbable that Iranians are going to return to the table. So, the question is how uh, can you convince us how the president is going to achieve his commitment that Iranians will not acquire a nuclear weapon while this situation right now looks like this? Well, history can be instructive. Uh, it can be instructive in a case like this when. Uh, we have a long history of pursuing this road uh, with our partners and allies vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran. The reason we were able in 2012, 2013, ultimately uh, 2013 and 2014 with the JPOA, subsequently with the JCPOA, uh, to arrive at a diplomatic <laughs> arrangement was because we worked with allies and partners around the world uh, to put significant economic pressure on Iran. What ultimately brought Iran to the table was not uh, a strategic change in mentality uh, on the part of the regime. It was, I think, a realization uh, that they were under tremendous economic duress. Uh, and rather than provide them with uh, a strategic asset, their nuclear program at the time was a strategic liability. It's our goal to uh, ensure that Iran continues to feel pressure until and unless it changes course. Now, you can do that uh, as the United States, the last administration, attempted to do that uh, with the strategy of maximum pressure. That clearly didn't work. What history teaches us uh, is that economic pressure is most effective when it's brought to bear with al other allies and partners. And so that's why we've put such a premium on working with our European allies and partners, particularly with the uh, so-called E3, the France, the, the French, the Brits, uh, and the Germans uh, in this case but also bringing along other EU allies and partners, uh, countries around the world, uh, to see to it that until and unless the Iranian regime changes uh, its approach, uh, it is going to feel the condemnation, but even more importantly, uh, the economic and diplomatic pressure of the rest of the world. Yeah, but don't you have a lot of in the Western part? Go, go, go ahead. 
Yeah, I have a, a follow up on gravel as well. I, I want to follow up on Iran. It's possible. Yeah. Do you see this roller coaster in your approach? You know, towards in Iran, uh, Iran's uh, nuclear issues is the reason why uh, we keep seeing Iran regime is holding sham trials, executing some of the reserves because they don't get strongest message from the West in terms of potential consequences. You mentioned, uh, you know, uh, financial and other. Uh, Price that they might pay. Can you give us any, any example of uh, say going after Iranian leaders and their children in here in the United States uh, financially and, and by other tangible steps that we have been taking? Uh, Alex, we've we've taken a number of, of tangible steps, and we've announced some of those steps even in recent months. You already alluded uh, to the actions we took uh, last Friday against seven Iranian individuals for uh, their support to Iranian UAV proliferation networks. We've announced uh, sanctions on Iranians uh, on Iran's petrochemical uh, industry. Uh, we've around, we've announced sanctions uh, on its uh, oil production uh, industry. Uh, we have announced very tangible actions. I haven't seen a roller coaster in terms of this administration. Our approach has been remarkably steady. Uh, our approach has been to work uh, day in, day out with allies and partners uh, to present a united front to Iran. But they, but they do not prevent Mohammad Mehdi currently, Mohammad Hussein, from being executed. I mean, that's clear not to uh, And Alex, there will be escalating costs. Uh, for the Iranian regime. We're mixing apples and oranges uh, just a bit here. Uh, we are talking about its nuclear program, but uh, there are, of course, uh, other uh, hugely important uh, challenges in the relationship, uh, not the least of which is Iran's treatment of its own citizens. Uh, and this is something that has uh, been put on display uh, with the uprising of the Iranian people, the uh, fact that so many uh, of Iran's citizens, including uh, at the vanguard, it's women and girls, have taken to, to the streets. And we have seen uh, the disdain that the Iranian regime has for its own people, the brutality with which uh, it has treated its own people. You raised the most recent executions. Look, we are appalled by Iran's executions of Mohammad Mehdi Karami and Mohammad uh, Hosseini, and the sentencing, I should add, of additional individuals to death uh, for involvement in protests. Uh, these two individuals were put to death following what can only be called sham trials, sham tr trials that uh, were rushed, that lacked any fair trial guarantees. Uh, we condemn these executions in the strongest terms. But these executions are, in our estimation at least, a key component of Iranian authorities' brutal effort. Uh, their brutal effort to suppress peaceful protests that began in September following the death of Masa Amini and the custody of the so-called morality police. Uh, we're deeply concerned that Iranian authorities uh, may imminent, imminently execute other Iranians after sham trials that similarly lack fair trial guarantees, uh, especially teenagers and youth. Uh, as part of their brutal crackdown. Uh, the young people of Iran, it is clear, are bearing the brunt of this repression, of this brutality. And we're aware of reports that several young people have had their sentences upheld uh, and, as I mentioned, may be at imminent risk uh, of execution. Rather than listen to the young people, to the women, to the girls uh, of Iran, the regime is trying to silence them, and in some cases, uh, the regime is even killing them. Mm -hmm. Uh, anything else on Iran? Or, I yeah, go ahead. Another one I was going to ask my follow-up question. So you tried to actually one questions about the ex-president of Iran here. I'm just trying to directly ask you. Are you ready? You said you are going to cooperate with the investigators in the president. Are you ready to cooperate to an extent to extradite the president of Iran to the country if they need him there? Uh, as I've said before, we are ready to uh, respond uh, swiftly and as appropriate to any requests uh, from the Brazilian government. We have not yet received uh, any such requests. And also, one more, please. Okay. Sorry. My questions were broken down. Uh, but anyway, Canada has announced that uh, they have made an, reached an agreement with the United States about the F 35, aiming the F 35. Uh, do you have anything on that? I, I don't, and typically we would not uh, speak to any potential arms transfers. Uh, until and unless we've notified them to Congress. Yes. 
going back to Iran again and on executions, um, do you have anything other than statements like, uh, are you pushing for any sort of uh, international effort? Because Canada today, they imposed uh, five sanctions. Uh, European countries are summoning Iranian diplomats. Do you have anything other than statements? Yes, absolutely. It's precisely why at the United Nations uh, last year, we pushed for the Commission of Inquiry. Uh, we pushed for the Commission so that it is not only the United States watching closely, as we always are. It is not only other countries, our European allies among them, watching closely, as they always are. Uh, but to see to it that uh, the world's preeminent body, in many respects, has a standing commission uh, that is solely and exclusively trained on the brutality that the Iranian regime is perpetrating against its own citizens. Uh, it was hugely important that we were able to create uh, this entity. It's hugely important that this entity uh, is able to fulfill its important mandate. We are going to continue to uh, help uh, the Commission of Inquiry uh, uh, fulfill the mission that was set out for it, uh, just as we continue to train the eyes uh, of the UN, of our partners, uh, on what's happening to the Iranian people. And on JCPOA, um, you mentioned about working with allies, uh, European allies. One of the things you can do is to ask them to activate snapback mechanism. That's one way of working with allies. And why you don't do that? This is a decision for our European partners. Um, this goes back to some of the questions we've talked about earlier, the historical antecedents that describe why we're not in the JCPOA, why we're not in a position ourselves uh, to have a vote one way or another on snapback. This is a question for the Europeans. Yes. Going back to the virtual meeting uh, between Russia President Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping, is it still the US position that the China is not providing material assistance to Russia amid it's war on Ukraine. The reason I ask is I want to know if you have anything on reports that Russia AN-124 military transport aircraft frequent visit to China, including various cities like Zhengzhou, Shanghai, Guangzhou, etc. Is there any indication that material assist assistance has been provided to Russia via uh, through these types of transport? I don't have a new assessment to offer. It is still very much the position of the U.S. government uh, that we are, number one, watching very closely. Number two, uh, if we see uh, the provision of security assistance to Russia for use in Ukraine to do what Russia has been doing uh, to the people of Ukraine, to the state of Ukraine, to the government uh, of Ukraine, or if we see the PRC taking action to systematically assist Russia, evade uh, sanctions, of course, uh, there, there will be costs. Yes. How closely is uh, U.S. monitoring the uh, AN-124 military transport to China back and forth? We are, we are, we are very closely watching, uh, uh, watching all of and them. And one final general speaking on U.S.-China relationship, um, like what type of people-to-people uh, -people exchange programs do you envision that could be re uh, resumed or achieved in 2023? Well, I don't have any uh, programs to, to speak to today, but when we talk about the bilateral relationship between the United States and the People's Republic of China, uh, we typically refer to the government-to-government -government relationship. That's what we call the most consequential bilateral relationship um, on, on the planet. But it is a relationship that transcends governments. Uh, it is a relationship uh, that has a private sector, a business, and economic uh, element that is driven and led by the private sector, uh, but there's also a, a vibrant people-to-people -people element, and there may be ways to make that people-to-people -people element even more vibrant, whether that uh, is through exchanges, whether it's through uh, new programs, restarting defunct programs. Uh, we're going to look at all of that uh, to see to it that uh, we have a relationship that, first and foremost, is serving uh, the interests of the United States, uh, but a relationship that is also serving our people. Ultimately, that's what we seek to do. Yep. Thank you, Nid. Uh, on the Under Secretary Fernandez visit to Seoul this week, uh, will the Under Secretary Fernandez discuss the IRA issue during the, his visit? Is there uh, any optimistic solution to South Korea's electric vehicles subsidy? 
So I imagine this will be a topic of conversation when uh, Jose Fernandez is uh, in Korea this week. He'll then uh, be traveling to Tokyo to take part in the Indo-Pacific Business Forum, as I mentioned uh, at the top, just as we've said with our European allies. This is a consequential piece of legislation. It's a complicated piece of legislation. It's a large uh, piece of legislation. And so we are prepared to work with our allies and partners, in this case, of course, with the ROK, uh, to talk about implementation uh, of this legislation and ways we can work to uh, uh, take into account those concerns. What, uh, what is the U.S. position about the Hyundai Motor Company's statement that it will reconsider investment in the United States if South Korea's electric vehicle subsidy is not resolved? I wouldn't weigh in on the statement of a, of a private company. Obviously, our relationship with the ROK, um, it is uh, uh, extraordinarily multifaceted. And one of those facets is uh, the private sector uh, two-way investment. Uh, by two-way, I mean American companies investing in South Korea, South Korea, South Korean companies investing in the United States. We want to make sure that two-way pipeline is as robust as uh, we can accomplish. And that's part of the reason why Undersecretary Fernandez uh, is in Korea this week. Uh, yes. yes. I have a question on, on Turkey. I helped you last week. Uh, uh, you spoke again highly of Turkey as a very important ally of NATO and United States. But uh, Turkey accused uh, both NATO and United States of cooperation with terrorists. Um, they mean uh, the Kurds of Syria, I think. Are the Syrian Kurds uh, uh, of the YPG, uh, are your allies or they are terrorists, as Turkey says? Well, there is no denying that Turkey faces uh, a complex security environment. Turkey has endured more terrorist attacks than any other NATO ally. Uh, we want to work with Turkey to address its security concerns. We believe that we can uh, work with Turkey to address those concerns while still uh, prosecuting uh, the shared challenge that we have in Syria. And that is to see to it that ISIS is not in a position to reconstitute. The coalition to defeat ISIS or Daesh has achieved significant gains in recent years. We don't want to see to it that those significant gains are put at risk or worse, rolled back. Uh, and so, of course, we're going to continue to have close consultations with uh, Turkey on this. Uh, we uh, understand and appreciate uh, their position. We recognize their position. Uh, and we need to continue our close coordination and cooperation with Turkey on these very shared challenges. But you cooperate at the, at the same time with the YPG, correct? Uh, our Kurdish partners on the ground have been an important element in uh, that campaign that I referenced to take on uh, and to roll back and ultimately to eliminate Daesh. Uh, of course, there are terrorist groups that pose a threat to Turkey. The PKK is one of them. We've been uh, clear about that. We can work to address Turkey's legitimate security concerns without losing sight of what is ultimately our shared objective. And that is to see to it that ISIS uh, is not in a position to regain strength or to reconstitute itself. So if I write that uh, the Syrian Kurds are not uh, terrorists and they are your al allies, I'm, I am correct? Uh, you're painting with a very broad brush. I am uh, I'm, I'm speaking to uh, specific security concerns, uh, but I'll tell you who is an ally. Turkey is an ally. Uh, we look forward to continuing to work closely uh, with Turkey on, on shared concerns. Yes. So, so, so you're not ready for the pronunciation? <laughs> I, uh, I, I suspected you might be going here. Uh, <laughs> there, uh, there, of course, is always in all of our uh, policies uh, built-in leeway when it comes to pronunciation. And right. so, of like course, we always beg places. your we always beg your forbearance when it comes to pronunciation. I certainly do, given my own pronunciation. Uh, but just as the uh, board on geographic names allowed for some leeway. Uh, in certain circumstances where we can promote broader public understanding, uh, I am going to stick with has, the previous pronunciation. Has anyone asked the Board of Geographic Names on a, a, uh, about the checks? Checks in? I, 
You are welcome to, as an enterprising journalist. Well, I'm just wondering if, <laughs> you know, because there's been, you know, a lot has been made about, uh, you know, Swaziland, sure, Martini, sure, and I, Macedonia, I, North I, Macedonia. I am not aware of. About, uh, Czechia. I'm, I am not aware of a request that we've seen. They from, are a NATO ally. I'm not aware of a request we've received from our Czech allies to uh, have okay. their name formally, uh, or the spelling of their name, uh, changed. But uh, I would check. Check in with them. Check in no. with them. <laughs> uh, yes. Thank you. Well done. Uh, when uh, last week you announced the largest PDA package for Ukraine, um, the Pentagon said that the purpose of this um, was uh, to change the dyna dynamic uh, on the battlefield. And I'm wondering, does that mean that you're concerned about the current dyna <laughs> dynamic? And uh, I, do you feel that it's going the wrong direction? And a second one, if I may. Um, over several weeks now, we have um, official statements about, you know, highlighting the growing role of um, the Wagner Group and uh, the Evgeny Pugazhin, uh, becoming an alternative se center of power in to the Russian military. And I wonder if, um, if this is, is a source of concern for you or, or maybe hope, because <laughs> you know, it's a sign of change. Uh, sure. So on your first question, uh, there are several dynamics at play in Ukraine. Uh, one dynamic is the dynamic that uh, you've heard from us, from our Ukrainian partners, and that is a dynamic under which uh, they have demonstrated consistently their resilience, but also their effectiveness on the battlefield, resting back uh, thousands upon thousands of square miles uh, of territory that Russia had laid claim to, that Russia had forcibly uh, taken at one point from uh, Ukraine that is now back where it belongs in uh, Ukrainian hands. But the broader dynamic is one in which there remain thousands upon thousands of Russian forces on sovereign Ukrainian territory with Russian assets regularly raining down firepower onto Ukraine's towns, its cities, targeting uh, civilian infrastructure. So that is a dynamic, of course, uh, that uh, we would seek to change, a dynamic um, that uh, the provision of this additional security assistance, some $3 billion, when you take into account the presidential drawdown authority uh, and the foreign military financing that we announced uh, last Friday, will seek to change uh, because it provides uh, additional capabilities, new capabilities in this, in this case, include, including uh, armored fighting vehicles, but also the type of air defense systems that our Ukrainian partners have used to such extraordinary effect uh, to take on the threat from Iranian-produced UAVs, in some cases eliminating every single drone before it's able to pose an uh, imminent threat to Ukrainian citizens, uh, but more broadly, protecting Ukrainian infrastructure, protecting uh, the Ukrainian people. Uh, so uh, our goal is to continue, and we will continue to support our Ukrainian partners uh, for as long as it takes. On your second point, um, I wasn't, it was on Prigozhin. Yeah, and uh, like, how do you um, assess this, you know, the, you, you <coughs> highlight that his uh, role is growing and uh, like that his, he's becoming an alternative um, uh, center of power to the Russian military. So I don't know if you see it as a positive development or, or, or not. Well, it, it certainly reeks of desperation. Uh, it certainly suggests that the Russians are becoming increasingly, turning to increasingly drastic means uh, to project force beyond Russia's borders into Ukraine. There are now tens of thousands uh, of fighters associated not with the Russian military, but with the Wagner Group. Uh, and if you look at the backgrounds of so many of these fighters, uh, these are not highly trained infantrymen. These are convicts. In many case, cases, these are individuals who have been uh, accused and uh, convicted of heinous crimes, violent crimes, murder, rape, uh, who are now fighting in Ukraine because they've been promised pardon or leniency. Uh, that itself is repugnant. Uh, human rights groups have condemned it as extra legal. Uh, we have made the point that it reeks of desperation. It's not going to change. Uh, the ultimate tide of battle. A couple of final questions, Michael? Yeah, um, real quick. Do you have any um, update on the Edwin Chibola case in Kenya, and has the U.S. offered any sort of assistance to the Kenyan authorities to investigate? 
Well, uh, of course, we commented on the on the the death, uh, the tragic death, uh, apparent killing of Edwin Ch Ch Chiloba uh, last week. We sent our condolences uh, to his family, to his loved ones, but also uh, to the LGBTQI plus community uh, in Kenya uh, during their during their time of mourning. There were so many in that community in Kenya who benefited from his leadership, from his visibility, from his uh, support. Violence uh, against LGBTQI plus persons uh, or anyone, of course, is unacceptable. Uh, but when violence stems from possible bias or stigma, it indirectly harms all members uh, of the targeted community. Uh, ultimately, acts of intolerance, uh, ultimate, the ultimate act of intolerance has no place in free and open societies. Uh, we made the point last week that uh, we urge and expect the Kenyans to conduct a thorough and transparent investigation uh, into his death. And of course, uh, if there's anything we can do to assist, we stand ready to do that. Yes, Mel. Thanks. Just quickly again on the diplomatic visa without mentioning any names. If someone came into the U.S. as a head of state on an A1 visa and then was hospitalized and then their visa ran out, <laughs> and then their visa ran out, uh, would they be permitted to stay in a hospital in the U.S. as long as they need? And completely separately, do you have any comment on former President Bolsonaro being hospitalized? <laughs> I, uh, on your second question, I, I'm, uh, I'm aware of the reports that he has been hospitalized. Of course, he's a private citizen, uh, so we wouldn't comment on that uh, from from here. Uh, and on your first question, um, I wouldn't want to even weigh in. Uh, yes. yes. One last thing. Um, with the, all the events this week with Japanese Prime Minister in town, the case of uh, Lieutenant Rich Alconis, who's imprisoned in Japan, um, how front and center should we expect that to be as Secretary Blinken raised this case with his Japanese counterpart? Should you expect President Biden to raise this with um, Kishida? Uh, we, of course, have a close relationship with our Japanese allies. That close relationship will be on full display this week when Secretary Blinken uh, meets with uh, his uh, counterpart when uh, with Foreign Minister Hayashi, uh, when later in the day he and Secretary Austin meet jointly with their counterparts in the context of the so-called 2 plus 2. And then on Friday, of course, when President Biden meets with uh, Prime Minister uh, Kishida of Japan. It's a relationship that allows us to broach uh, every uh, issue. Of course, uh, we are prepared to discuss this case. It's a tragic case. Uh, for all involved, we're working to find a, compass a compassionate uh, resolution uh, to this case, uh, but uh, I wouldn't want to go further than that. Has the secretary raised this with his Japanese counterpart before today? Because you're saying we're prepared to. Uh, this case has been discussed with our Japanese allies. Yes. Mm -hmm. John, I was wondering if you have anything from you on the legal position of the Republic of who's a resident also who's in jail and in Kansas. Uh, along with several others, including Bakhtiar Hajiyev. Sure, we're, we're deeply troubled by the arrests and detention of Bakhtiar Hajiyev uh, and Tofig Yakoblu. We urge the authorities to release them expeditiously. We remain strongly committed to advancing respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. And again, uh, we urge the government to expect its citizens' rights, including the rights uh, to express views peacefully. Uh, yeah, uh, just question. quickly, sure. um, just uh, one of the things you mentioned at the top, uh, Pakistan and, and the assistance. Uh, Pakistan at the, the donors conference today, uh, the, the, the resilience conference in Geneva, so that this is time to relax IMF conditions, the restructuring package. Uh, does the U.S. have any stance on that and whether this aid is contingent on continued reforms in Pakistan? Uh, this is ultimately a decision for the IMF, uh, so would uh, defer to them uh, on that. We, of course, want to see Pakistan continue down the path uh, of reform. We want to be a partner. We will continue to be uh, a Pakistan, uh, partner to Pakistan uh, when it comes to uh, all of their priorities, whether it's uh, security, uh, whether it's economic uh, in this case, or humanitarian uh, in the case of the provision uh, of the additional funding for the flood relief today. Thank you all very much. Thank you.